There's an imbalance in the integrity and in how we depict narratives and characters across all media. From the novels we consume to the films we digest, the freedom of character treatment is bound not just to the author's intent, but the human morality that is the foundation for a distributor's restrictions. And those limitations grow tighter the more the audience is capable of feeling the depicted events. So with live action cinema, the sensibilities of younger performers need to be accommodated for, especially in more mature narratives resulting in a perpetual protective bubble surrounding them that slowly lessened over time, allowing for deeper and more weighted narratives. Yet those restrictions grant more wiggle room for novels than films in terms of the graphic detail that can be displayed or discussed, while simultaneously limiting the more visual aspects of cinema, where the viewer has very little control over how they perceive a story's events while alternatively granting the opportunity for viewers to feel more uncomfortable and make the gravitas of the situation more apparent. With children, those lesser restrictions have allowed for their more creative and thoughtful handling, both on an emotional and developmental level, as they explore their transitions into new emotions, dealing with their trauma, and less often, forced early maturation. The results have since allowed for some of the most fleshed out and personal character stories that have since ingrained themselves as cinema classics and masterpieces. The consequences of this more focused writing and character and relationship-driven narratives is pointing out the cheap commonality and stigmatization of children being exploited narratively in the larger scope of writing in cinema as emotional baggage, plot devices, and crutches for development in regards to the film's protagonists, while adding false attachments to said characters for the observer's sake, despite them being underdeveloped and unjustified in design and work. So it's a shame that come the portrayal of kids in video games, those that make up our perceived collective of amazing characters often fail to meet the likes of Ophelia or Carlos from Del Toro's movies and sacrifice their depth at the cost of appeal while simultaneously using their status as children to excuse plot contrivances and the lack of their contribution to the key narrative. Games are always interactive experiences, but as a visual medium like cinema, they follow similar logic in their framing when outside the player's control, allowing for manipulation in the extent to which we feel on-screen events by juxtaposing cinema and interactions to make players liable for how narratives and gameplay unfold for a more personal experience. By doing so, you're effectively able to manipulate player perception of stories to both make them more ignorant to the faults in writing, while adding immense weight to moments of conflict and struggle that can make even the simplest writing feel like the most grandeur of moments simply due to having player control. Some games such as Ico and Metal Gear Solid 3 use this blending of elements as the foundation of their design to offer deeper experiences. Yet as times progressed, there's been a noticeable increase in cinematic games presentation and the stories they've tried to provide did so under the guise of maturity while coming off more as a teen's novel. But those philosophies came to a head with Telltale's The Walking Dead, but more importantly, The Last of Us, where children were put at the forefront of the narrative. It's kind of impossible to talk about modern video game storytelling without mentioning these titles given their praise and the trends they set up for the following years, both narratively and mechanically. Nevertheless, despite their generic zombie stories and characters, this so-called game design revolution came about by chance timing. Back in the 70s and 80s, the first true generation of individuals entrapped in gaming culture from youth would find themselves the core demographic for developers in the 90s and turn of the century. So to pander to them, developers developers slowly began to focus on increasingly mature titles as that generation grew up. While that generation would manage to bring prominence to the industry, they'd be doing so at a time where they came to make up the majority of the gaming press, and as a result would gain control over the narrative in games media at a time when they'd be well past their 20s and having children. The inevitable consequence is the so-called parenting or daddy simulator having a greater sense of relatability to consumers based on its prospect of interacting with children as they grow to fend for themselves more readily and as they in turn soften up to the protagonist and vice versa, doubling up on their appeal with their fantasized worlds, possibly even finding appeal in younger players looking to have children later in life or more appeal to older players looking to recapture that long since past experience of raising their own children. Finding a shallow connection with these youths based around their labels rather than their characters well, character. A bond that only appears deeper when control shifts between those two figures, allowing the player to better feel the fruits of their labor in raising said children. The focus on paternal relationships isn't an inherently bad idea, and it's been used to great effect in stories like Leon the Professional, as the cold assassin Leon takes on a fatherly role towards the young and abused Matilda after she witnesses her dysfunctional family's murder. But their relationship is symbiotic for their development, as the childlike Leon becomes more selfless and compassionate 
compassionate, while Matilda is forced into early maturity. Becoming an assassin as well as coping and sorting out her newfound emotions primarily brought about by Leon's role as her teacher and first caring father figure, before the film finally climaxes in Leon's death, leaving Matilda to fulfill Leon's last wish of settling down so she can lead a normal life, albeit as a more hardened yet broken individual. And in other films like Pan's Labyrinth and The Devil's Backbone, the children take the leading role as their conflict surrounds matured men that they must protect other younger individuals from, that result in their own developments, conflicts, and early maturation. Those developments stop the characters from feeling like props and more like actual people, but in games that relationship is often one-sided as the child is often used as a crutch for the actual protagonist's development when they're not acting as a plot device, essentially placing them in a protective bubble. In fact, children are often exceptions from the worlds of mature rated titles. Some populate them while being exempt from standard rules of play to prevent them from harm, while others exist solely away from those worlds entirely, sometimes only appearing as props meant to, as previously stated, act as the anchor for the protagonist's development, deconstruction, and source of motivation. As a result, they're often relegated to one-dimensional personalities, and while they might grow into a character that is more readily able to defend themselves, they don't develop as people and are robbed of any character arcs that, in all reality, should be happening. Children aren't developed persons, they're still growing and are often inexperienced meaning that in terms of their depth, they're often left to grow into their identities rather than the adults who've cemented themselves in those roles. But rather than address this directly, devs have found an alternative. To counter this lack of development and intrigue, studios began to exploit interactions with the game by creating puzzles and mechanics that were dependent on those secondary characters, all to instill a sense of player dependence on them, sometimes even letting players control them to further that connection and make the player feel more responsible for their fate. But when set away from your control, they're often turned into active non-elements, primarily towards the player's sense of risk and danger as the tension is focused solely on their own personal play. By manipulating the story and mechanics across a possible 10 plus our venture, developers can minimize the risk of players developing and building resentment towards certain characters and vice versa. But it's the former that often makes up the status of partners in such instances, even if it comes at the cost of the player's immersion. Though through such manipulation, it robs the player of a deeper experience that would be available by turning them into active assets. By coherently melding narrative and mechanical design such as in Brothers Tale of Two Sons and Resident Evil 4, they were able to better convey their tension and get players invested in their characters mechanically rather than narrative narratively, while granting users majority control over their partners and consequences of their actions. Brothers gave players control over both characters with both halves of the controller, and accordingly gave players two objects of focus in gameplay, ultimately conveying the surviving brother's growth come the end by having him use both controller ends to narratively signify his brother's influence over him. But Resident Evil 4 did things a bit differently with Ashley, even if she wasn't a child. It may not have been a character or emotionally driven title such as the ones I've mentioned so far, but because Ashley had a own health bar, Capcom had to make her someone players needed to care for mechanically, and the method they used was by having her be an actual asset in gameplay despite being unable to fight. To work around this, Ashley doesn't climb down ladders, but rather Leon catches her to speed up the process. Because enemies target her, but she clings to Leon, it keeps the focus feeling as though it's on the player and puts a bigger emphasis on precise aiming to protect not just yourself, but Ashley as well as she is capable of taking player damage even when not captured. She can hide when commanded to, let players use her as bait to alleviate enemy pressure, as well as operating cranks in place of the player. She can even assist the player by calling out when in danger or by mentioning key points of interest. Leon, shoot those barrels on that wagon! While other partner characters may do one or two of those elements, it's how much care and detail that went into her design, not just narratively, but mechanically and atmospherically, that make her an active element, as she allowed developers to craft more variety in level design, challenges, and the game's pacing, while also giving the player more creative options in how they wanted to play, all without disrupting the game's flow. Meaning losing Ashley didn't just have ramifications for the story, but the developers and player as well, as it decreased the scope of the game's design, placing her value above that of the part characters that would come after her, as they'd largely be relegated to being ignored by the game when it's convenient for the player and designer. On repeat playthroughs though, you can even equip her in a suit of armor that makes her invulnerable to enemies and damage, just in case you're looking to play for fun. It may not result in everyone liking her, but it does create a deeper sense of tension and dread in the player, the ideal emotions for a horror shooter. So when other developers create characters and non-puzzles that impede gameplay rather than enhance it, it comes off more as an inconvenience in gameplay 
gameplay, made at the cost of immersing the player in their story. Rarely a good idea, with minimal exceptions. While such tactics may work for some, it's little more than a gamified version of Hollywood's child exploitation. Because the value of children in games is focused on them acting as likable and relatable figures that can be easily marketed, rather than captivating the player mechanically, or building them up in the story as intriguing characters through their motivations, actions, and depth. The actual elements that transform mere images and personalities into the icons that stick with us throughout the years, perhaps even causing the viewers to reflect upon themselves and how they perceive the world. The most common form of the ideal in crafting likable characters is they fail to work on anything more than a surface level because they fail to ask the question of what the cost of their character is. They might be idealistic, antisocial, perhaps even overly emotional, but they never ask why those traits are in place or explore them enough to grant them meaning. Rather, they are expected and used as a shorthand for damaged and powerless characters without properly justifying it, leaving them to wallow in their own misery. Combined with the protective bubble that surrounds them, it only makes it more difficult to work with and results in titles such as The Last of Us, Persona 5, and even Life is Strange only skirting the line of true trauma and conflict, frequently saving such subjects for the sequels with mixed results. They can't be damaged or suffer any real lasting danger, and as a result the characters fail to meet their environments and at worst only suffer from an implied trauma, only truly being afflicted when death becomes necessity, making it harder to believe in the true perils of a given situation when their mere existence and well-being are the only things keeping the story moving forward. Forward. Accordingly, all trauma and damage begins to feel superficial and our characters fail to change as a result, because they're never given a chance to cope with the events in life they're often unable to control, sometimes even solving seemingly deep personal conflict in a matter of sentences. And it's done so habitually with no weighted and introspective dialogue, making it feel as though they're hitting a series of checklists, as they instead opt for predictable and uninspired conversations and actions. The setup and cause of their trauma and tendencies may be laid out, but are rarely delved into enough to flesh out the characters at hand. In extreme cases, the subject is merely touched upon before being brushed aside or made irrelevant to the offending party, only ever being relevant to the player, turning what should be challenges towards a character's psyche and principle into senseless arguments and more commonly situations of physical conflict that leaves their character mentally unscathed, frequently turning what should be small developments and moments of trauma into little more than wasted prospects as they revert back to the characters they were prior, nullifying the consequences of those stories and turning their labels into their identity rather than aspects of their person and development. This meaning there's never a chance for them, or the player, to reflect and grow from, possibly even losing the chance to solidify their descents into madness, leaving them as flat personalities that consistently fail to meet their potential. Should arbitrary revelations or shifts in character or tone occur without proper warrant, and the writing fail to acknowledge and explore this by having them grow into and earn those shifts, all those changes can ever remain as arbitrary and wasted. When a character, protagonist or not, is given the time to grow grow and develop, they're capable of evolving into something greater, with Emil acting as one of the few rare exceptions to how children are handled in games. His status is not just an arbitrary decision, but it plays into his role of an unaging individual cursed to turn others to stone on sight, thus stopping him from pursuing romantic relationships, only being worsened by melding with his sister, gaining him sight and power at the cost of his humanity and only coping by finding a family in Vice, Kaine, and Nier, even as he learns the true nature of the shades he's been killing, eventually revealing his own self-loathing to his friends in the game's final dungeon before exploiting the power given to him by the source of his trauma to save his friends from danger, solidifying his growth and development into his power and character at the cost of making himself a sacrifice through the only selfish action he makes throughout the game's duration. So when reflecting on how children are handled in games, I can only think of their overabundant misuse as props and their stark contrast to the kids in film and television, one shaped by their world and lives that made them transcend past their contemporaries, the children of Pan's Labyrinth, Devil's Backbone, Nier, and Leon weren't kids for the sake of being kids. They had purpose and were coping with their worlds and identities, exploring what it meant to be a child, discovering new emotions, dealing with trauma, dealing with their families, maturing at a young age, and ultimately leaving us as new individuals. They were damaged, but they were all the more beautiful for it.
10 years ago, the most popular genre was the shooter, not for its fun factor, but because it was what the consensus deemed mature due to their realistic and bloody nature, operating under the false pretenses of maturity. Today, most mature games operate under the guise of being cinematic and deep emotional stories with profound and nuanced characters, despite the poor writing and trappings that consume them. When video game stories are forever praised in using children as props instead of individuals and continue to tackle their subjects of loss, trauma, and individual with cold feet, then it's no different than having never mentioned or touched upon such subjects in the first place. And like the shooters and players that came from a decade back, we're all left fools as we continue to be complicit with the false sense of maturity that we've set up for ourselves. And so long as it continues, all we'll be left with are the low standards for writing that plague the industry as we know it. Hey everybody, I want to thank you all so much for watching and I want to extend my love and thanks because I haven't uploaded in like four months and that was mainly due to me getting distracted by doing illustrations for a book series, which I'm still doing by the way, possibly even doing a comic series after this. So we're going to see how that goes. I'm going to try and focus more on my videos now because I've only done very little writing over the last few months and I want to get back into it. Um, so you know, new videos once I hit the public button and do pay very close attention to how I have worded things in this video. Not once do I say things like, oh, these characters are terribly written or I hate these characters. I'm simply pointing out like these characters are kind of disappointing when you think about it and how much praise they've received because they're all kind of formulaic. Don't think everything I say applies to literally every character I've mentioned. Obviously like the characters in Persona 5 do not function the same as those in The Last of Us. They're completely different genres. But yes, do pay close attention. Think about what I've said. Tell me what you thought about it in the comments. Tell me your thoughts on how children are handled in games and I'll see you all next time. Much love.